coming out on a Friday at 3 to an event called Swimming Underwater and Holding Your Breath. A title whose effectiveness I have only myself to blame. <laughs> it was a quick decision. It was that Scott Fitzgerald reference. And we learn. So think of this a little bit of an experiment. I just want to talk very quickly. Um, in the past, you know, Prelude has featured writers on a certain topic and looked at their work when it's finished in published format. Uh, but it hasn't, to my knowledge, really featured uh, people who, for whom writing is a part of their practice with their work in process, um, just inviting them in the same way that we extend an invitation to artists to share their work in its early or, or recently finished development. So I really want to thank uh, Isaac and Tavia and Chani and David for jumping into this experiment and for everyone here. Um, this is like a kind of select working group is how I think of it on this project. Um, so we'll have uh, all the participants uh, present their work and then we're going to do a quick kind of Q&A that I'll moderate and then we'll open it up to questions. I, hopefully this can become very conversational if that's the will of the group. Um, but thank you everyone for coming and without further ado, Isaac Butler. Hey. Hello everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on this book right now called uh, The Method. Uh, it'll have some long subtitle that's good for search engine optimization, but uh, it is a, essentially a biography of, of The Method, of this idea about art and human beings and acting that was probably wrong, but also changed uh, American pop culture. So. Um, uh, before I get started, you know, the, the one of the two people who brought <coughs> Stanislavski's teaching to the United States, the woman, <coughs> excuse me, who taught both uh, Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler acting was this woman named Maria Ospinskaya, who was uh, very small, she weighed about 95 pounds, <coughs> and she would come into class with a, a glass of water and a pitcher. This was during Prohibition, it was actually gin, and she wore a monocle, and she terrified all of them, but she would always begin every class with, Make for me good atmosphere. So if you could do that, I would uh, really appreciate it. Um, this is just a little excerpt from um, a chapter from the Russia section. I have, no one has ever seen this. You are the first. So thank you for that. <clears throat> it's called, uh, it's a portion of a chapter called Do You Know the Secrets of Art? In either late September or early October of 1917, Richard Boleslavsky returned to Moscow, no longer quite sure who he was or what the city meant to him. Moscow had been a beloved stepmother, a bohemian wonderland that, as he would later remember it, caressed and soothed those who walked its streets, as Boleslavsky himself had done late at night after rehearsal. He had a newfound patriotism, though, a love of his not-yet-real Poland. He wondered who he was in this city and how he fit into its cosmopolitan workforce, where a wealthy man's house might sport a French cook, English butler, Russian wet nurse, Italian valet, Caucasian bodyguard, and Tartar janitor, all under one roof. At the, at the end of Boleslavsky's wartime service and his return to Moscow had been fraught with danger. In February, after widespread unrest, the Tsar at long last abdicated. His named successor and brother, Grand Duke Michael, refused the crown, and the Russian monarchy ended. Russia soon became a servant of two masters, the provisional government run by the Duma and the Petrograd Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. The Great War still rained down its storm of steel on the front, and the central powers yearned for a moment of weakness on Russia's part so they could knock them out of the war. The provisional government issued an order requiring soldiers to return to duty and obey their officers, but the Petrograd Soviet responded with Order Number One which instructed soldiers and sailors to instead obey the Petrograd Soviet above all and for the democratization of units. Now, units would elect representatives to the Petrograd Soviet and a committee to not only govern the units themselves, but to confiscate all weapons in order to guarantee their power. To Leon Trotsky, order number one was a charter of freedom of the revolutionary army, and as it had originated with the soldiers themselves, the first fulfillment of the revolution's true potential. Boleslavsky, an officer, remembers order number one as the, as the entr'acte of a blood-soaked farce. Sure, as he wrote, the intention of order number one was the same as the French Declaration of Human Rights. Mental freedom was good, political freedom splendid, peace was beautiful, and so on. But the immediate effect of the order was, quote, that soldiers shot and killed officers, military orders were ignored, the fighting army ceased to exist. For Poles, the Great War was a civil conflict, not a global catastrophe. Both the Central Powers and the Allies had promised Poland independence if they won it. Polish men enlisted on both sides of the conflict, often fighting against members of their own villages or sometimes even their own families. In his memoir, Way of the Lancer, Boleslavsky recounts escorting some prisoners when one of them calls out to one of his soldiers, a man named Peter. They recognized each other, he writes. They were brothers. 
Poles. One was in the Russian army, the other in the Austrian. The brother in the Austrian had not heard anything about his family on the Russian side for three years. Boleslavsky had fought in World War I for Poland. When asked his politics, he would answer, I am a Pole. He felt his duty was to mother Poland, not stepmother Russia. If fighting for Russia held little appeal, the second war between the proletariat and the ruling classes held even less. After a few months suffering the indignity of Soviet control, the Polish Lancers hatched a plan. They would desert, meet up with Polish units on both sides of the front, and fight for an independent Poland. This plan failed, stranding the Lancers near the Galician front, where they exchanged fire with their former allies in the Russian army. The Lancers disbanded, and Boleslavsky fell back to his stepmother, bribing a station agent to secure a patch of floor on a train packed so sardine tight that people urinated where they stood, and physically fought to escape when the train stopped at their station. Moscow was hardly a safe haven for him. As a former officer and a white too proud to hide his anti-red beliefs, Boleslavsky's life was in danger. He was saved by his career in the theater. He lived in Moscow under his Russian stage name, but had enlisted with Polish pride as Boleslav's Ryzard Srednicki. He could also count on the protection of the holy knights of the first studio. Even the most hardened Bolshevik, and there were a few, wouldn't dare dime on a fellow member. The first studio saw its own upheavals during the war. In 1916, Leopold Suler Sulerzhitsky, beloved leader of the studio, wise Tolstoyan sage, world adventurer, source of joy and light for all who knew him, finally succumbed to nephritis that he had developed in Canada while resettling the Dukovers. His death cleft Stanislavski's heart in twain. One witness at the funeral described Konstantin Sergeyevich weeping like a child at the gravesite. The first studio needed a new leader, and Stanislavski appointed Evgeny Vaktingov to the post. A misanthrope with a wild temper, Vaktingov couldn't be further apart from Suler's nurturing calm style. And he also did not share Suler's singular focus on the first studio. He began his own private studio, and in the years before his own early death in 1922 from stomach cancer, directed wherever he could. Still, the studio soldiered on, only growing in reputation. When Boleslavsky returned, he walked into a heated meeting about its future. The studio, which had officially been absorbed into the Moscow Art Theater after Boleslavsky's production of Wreck of the Good Ship Hope, wanted its independence. Chafing under the diktats of the Moscow art, they wanted greater freedom over season planning, aesthetics, and their approach to the system. Stanislavski and Nemirovich were children of one era of epochal change, the emancipation of the serfs in the 20 years of incremental liberalization before the crackdown of the 1880s. The first studio were all of a younger generation, children of the failed 1905 revolution. They wanted autonomy rather than a gradual liberalization under a monarch, even a benevolent one like Konstantin Stanislavski. Although a white when it came to Russian politics, Boleslavsky was all for the red principles of self-determination and collective labor when it came to the first studio. He gave an impassioned speech in defense of its autonomy. Stanislavsky responded, still fermenting, still fermenting, my boy. But the greater freedom they sought was granted. Only afterwards he realized that in the theater I had taken part in something for which in the regiment the penalty was death. The death of Suler and the independence of the first studio drove a wedge between the holy temple of the system and its founder. As the years went by, Stanislavski would come to liken his studios to Lear's daughters, in the first studio to Goneril, Lear's eldest and most disloyal child. Stanislavski's own war years brought personal and professional trials that challenged the very foundation of his acting theories, and at one point nearly resulted in his death. When Gavrilo Princip's bullet pierced both Archduke Ferdinand's throat and the shaky stability of Europe on June 19, 1914, Stanislavski, his wife Lulina, Kachilov, the critic Nikolai Efros, and several friends were in Marienbad on holiday. There they marked the 10th anniversary of Chekhov's death, while Stanislavski continued work on an article, which he never finished, called Various Trends in the Art of the Theater, outlining the differences between what he called hack work, representation, and experiencing. When they heard the news of Ferdinand's death, they knew with the certainty of the condemned that war had become inevitable, but due to massive troop mobilization, train tickets back to Moscow were scarce. By August 4th, as Germany invaded Belgium, Stanislavski, Lilina, and a couple of others remained in what was swiftly becoming enemy territory. Their plan of escape involved taking a train to Munich and then another to Switzerland, where they could then travel to Russia. As Stanislavski describes it, by the time they got to Munich, the heat of war fever affected everything. All human uh, relations were changed, he wrote in My Life in Art. I will not describe all that the alien had to bear in an enemy country. Stanislavski, who cultivated his own vulnerability, naivete, and openness, while avoiding conflict whenever possible, was uniquely ill-suited to this voyage. On the way to Switzerland, German soldiers boarded his train, accused the Russians of being spies, and arrested them. 
The only reason Stanislavski survived that day was that he wasn't worth a bullet during an ammunition shortage. Instead, the soldiers dragged the great director who had so impressed the Kaiser less than a decade before to a fortress, imprisoning him and his wife for two days before deporting them to the very country they had been trying to reach in the first place. They then traveled from Geneva to Marseille, from Marseille to Odessa, and then at long last, from Odessa to Moscow. Out of these trials came a renewed patriotism on Stanislavski's part. Russian culture was a thing of great beauty and value. Intermingling with Europe benefited everyone, but for Russia, its own culture must remain, must remain supreme. And conveniently enough, had he not developed something purely Russian with the system? Was it not born of Shepkin, of Pushkin, of Gogol, of the three greatest artists to walk Russian soil? He made a speech to the Moscow Art Theater along these lines in September of 1914. The assembled company greeted it with skepticism. Everything Stanislavski encountered, the war, personal triumphs and failures, perhaps even his lunch, led him to redouble his efforts to perfect the system. But as even he, he acknowledged in my life in art, those efforts came at a cost to his actual work as a theater artist. As a director, his rehearsals became laboratories for his theater theories, stretching months or sometimes years as he sought the magic trick that would lead to experiencing on stage. And as he prepared new roles as an actor, he wandered so far into the tall weeds that he became lost there. In January of 1916, Stanislavski undertook the role of, I'm going to butcher all of these pronunciations, I'm just warning you, undertook the role of Colonel Rostenev in an adaptation of Dostoevsky's short story, The Village of Stepana Chikova. Yeah. This production, jointly overseen by Nemirovich and Stanislavski, if you don't know, Nemirovich is the co-founder of the Moscow Art Theater. He and Stanislavski, within about five years of its starting, grew to hate each other. Uh, but they co-directed many productions. This production, jointly overseen by Nemirovich and Stanislavski, finally brought their artistic differences to the breaking point. The heart of the fight had to do with the system and its approach to text and whether the actor or the writer was to be the chief creative force at the Moscow Art Theater. Plays have three basic elements, right? Dialogue, monologue, stage imagery. One of the system's great innovations was foregrounding how much of the actor's job lay in filling in the gaps between these three basic elements with their own inferences and inventions. Actors have been doing this forever, of course, but the system codified the creation of both subtext and extra textual fleshing out of a character's backstory in life as part of the actor's job. Today, this is so fundamental that we seldom question it, nor do we notice how few plays written after the system contain the kind of long self-expositing monologues that were staples before. In prose fiction, the author does much of this work herself. She has to. Fiction is unmediated. It lacks interpreters bringing it to life and has instead a much larger set of tools for creating a character and her world. In the original story of Stepan and Chikovo, Dostoevsky describes Colonel Rostoyev's psychology and backstory in great detail. It would be difficult to imagine a man more benign and compliant, he writes. His generosity was such that on occasion he would have been ready to part with everything down to his last shirt and hand it to any needy person he chanced to meet. Stanislavski, who instructed actors to find the good in villains and the bad in heroes, could never accept such a simple characterization. And his system, as his system instructed, he began with himself as the raw material for the part, rather than the original story. To Nemirovich, Stanislavski's approach was objectively wrong. Nemirovich knew who Rostinev was and how he should be interpreted because Dostoevsky had already explained him in great detail. <laughs> At the first rehearsal, the co-directors didn't argue so much as give the actors conflicting instruction. Nemirovich told the cast they would use the system, but that he would aid them in bringing out what should be conscious while hiding what should be unconscious. Stanislavski, meanwhile, declared that the actors must experience the play not only in the terms laid down by the author, but in all the circumstances which his own imaginations can create. Rehearsals dragged on and on as Stanislavski sought out ways to feed the subconscious. The cast fleshed out their characters' childhoods and figured out the tasks for each bit, but they were no closer to getting the play ready for an audience. In August of 1917, while Boleslavsky saw action at the front, Nemirovich wrote Stanislavski with an ultimatum. Stepanichikova must go up in September or October. The Moscow Art Theater's repertory was second to none, but they needed regular premieres. In 1915, they had only managed to produce one new show, A Night of Pushkin One Acts. A year without a premiere would be fatal to their reputation. But Stepanichkova was not finished in September, and Stanislavski, the actor, floundered. Suler's death put to rest any thought of premiering the play in 1916. On January 5, 1917, Namirovich again wrote Stanislavski. Ten months and 156 rehearsals later, Stepanichkova was no closer to finished. The season was almost over. Their reputation was in tatters. Nemirovich did what he felt he had to do. He took over the show. 
Stanislavski's feelings be damned. Watching rehearsals in February, Nemirovich recoiled in horror from Stanislavski's interpretation of Rostanov. Stanislavski felt he was so close, the truth was just out of reach. If he only had more time and a little faith from his collaborator, he could birth a son of himself and Dostoevsky that will bear many resemblances to both mother and father. But it was not to be. On March 28th, two weeks after order number one, 14 months after they'd begun working on it, Stepana Chikovo finally had its first dress rehearsal. Stanislavski, who had additionally played the lead in six repertory shows, watched his best friend die, weathered a crisis in his personal business, and founded a second studio, did not know his lines, did not have a clear sense of his character, and had no idea what he was doing. To the audience watching the dress, it appeared that he was having a nervous breakdown. Kachalov's son, Vadim, described Stanislavski's visible panic, the bewilderment, terror, and fear there in the way he looked towards the prompter's box. During intermission, Kachalov approached him. Go home, he said. Something awful is happening to Konstantin Sergeyevich. By the end of the night, Stanislavski stood in the wings, ashen and weeping. Nemirovich resigned himself to the inevitable and fired Stanislavski from the show. It was Stanislavski's greatest failure, and the blame lay solely with him and his system in his obsessive need to perfect his theories rather than serve the greater good of his productions. Stanislavski never publicly complained, but he also confined himself to his repertory roles for the rest of his life. Never again would the greatest living actor of the Russian stage perform in a new production. That part of his career was over. During 1917, he found what solace he could in the theater's new audiences. One of the provisional government's first steps after taking power had been to safeguard Russia's theater, the jewels and the crown of its national culture. The Duma appointed Nikolai Lvov, a great lover of the stage, to take over and de-imperialize the imperial theaters. A mere 10 days after the Tsar's abdication, the newly renamed State Theaters opened. With the birth of the provisional government, the restrictions on what plays could be performed for whom lifted. Stanislavski and Namirovich's dream of a theater that was open to all could finally come true. And no matter your politics, red, white, or in Stanislavski's case, indifferent, you could work at the Moscow Art through much of 1917 and barely notice the tumultuous arm wrestling match between the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet. When Richard Bolislavski returned to Moscow, he took back over his roles as if nothing had happened and began work on a new production of Twelfth Night. But that came to an end on October 24th, 1917. That night, Colonel Modal, the chief of the Moscow police and a longtime audience member of the Moscow Art Theater, ran backstage demanding to use their telephone. The actors didn't bother to hide their eavesdropping as he frantically shouted, burn it, burn everything, burn it at once. Modal turned to the actors. Petrograd, he told them, had fallen. Trotsky's Red Guard occupied the capital's key institutions. Within hours, they had seized Petrograd's railroads, telephone exchanges, telegraph stations, banks, and printing presses. The next morning, they would storm the Winter Palace and end the provisional government for good. Modal was in his police chief's uniform. Could he, perhaps, borrow a costume of some kind from the theater so he could get home without being murdered? <laughs> According to Boleslavsky's memoirs, within hours, Moscow transformed from a teeming polyglot metropolis into a city of silence punctuated by gunfire. Checkpoints choked its roads as the Bolsheviks sought out enemies of the people. Boleslavsky, both a white and a former officer, checked that particular box twice. The first studio, like all the other theaters, closed. To protect it, Boleslavsky, Michael Chekhov, Vera Solovyova, and a few others moved into the building. Chekhov and Boleslavsky shared a room and watch duties on the roof while the women stretched their food stores into meals. They lived communally, sharing everything except for cigarettes. During the war, the first studio had run a hospital for the wounded. For the revolution, they kept it open, a neutral territory where red and white could receive basic treatment from a nurse. Boleslavsky became embroiled in a last-ditch effort to, in his mind, save Moscow from the reds. An old friend from the Lancers, identified only as Alec, approached him with a scheme. Together they would make their way to Tver, now Kalinin, to their old cavalry school. They would convince the officers and their army in training to attack the city, which would inspire whites inside Moscow to revolt. Boleslavsky had sworn to the other members of the studio to put politics aside for the sake of their artistic home, but a Lancer's heart beat in his breast. Soon he was on his way to Tver, but the plan came to nothing. As his old instructor told him, the army obeyed the government. They had obeyed the Tsar, they had obeyed the Duma, now they must obey the Petrograd Soviet. Without deference to civilian leadership, they risked chaos. That chaos would come of its own accord, however, four short months later, when the Russian Civil War began. Thank you. Great, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm uh, taking 
you know, liberty to read from something that actually has been published, but since it's within the six month window, it's still <laughs> work in progress of reaching your, uh, your hands. Um, and also, um, I'm going to be um, uh, doing a kind of slight remix or condensation of a chapter to get it down to the appropriate length of time for this reading here, which has the side effect of me realizing that this whole chapter itself could have been half the length. <laughs> Anyways, such as like. Well, thank you for the invitation. To you. <laughs> the past has left images, the French historian Andre Montglant has written, comparable to those which are imprinted by light on a photosensitive plate. The future alone possesses developers active enough to scan such surfaces perfectly. One aspect of the surface of representation that Montglant's metaphor evokes is what photographers refer to as the crushed black. These are the shadow areas that lack detail and texture due to underexposure and are thus called blacked up or crushed, according to the Illustrated Dictionary of Photography. We see these crushed blacks in most prints of Shirley Clark's 1967 film, Portrait of Jason, including DVD releases up until the full restoration of the film in 2014. These underexposed grays and blacks in the film, what is more, seem to allegorically repeat the underexposure of the film, which has never been widely and consistently available until recently. Has the print left images on its surfaces that only the developers of today can scan perfectly? This formal question takes us directly to the dialectics of loss and salvation, which the film's subject, Jason Holliday, endures on screen and in the archives. Crushed blacks can be, concerted, can be considered a printing flaw, but they can also be deliberately employed for aesthetic effect. Crushed blacks seem to contain, in their monochromatic starkness, reserved images that might be revealed by a better developer in the future. But what happens when art, or theory, plums those reserves? Are we to accept the removal of the crushed blacks as the fulfillment of the filmmaker's vision? Would such a fulfillment somehow redeem the director, particularly in her vexed antagonistic relationship to her subject? Or is something vital missed by the current historicist's drive towards perfect audiovisual restoration with its oft accompanying impulse to repair the injured historical subject? If underexposed blacks on film are not simply devoid of content, but to the contrary, filled with incommensurabilities, traces of a past life untranslatable into our own, might we not instead find ways of valuing those zones of indistinction for and not in spite of their mystery? By what, by what method would we attempt such a transvaluation of the crushed black? Instead of history as we know it, would this other method be a sort of fabulation? Portrait of Jason is often described as the first feature film with a queer black protagonist. It is now a classic document of the cinema verite movement as well as an important work by an American female director. The black and white film consists of approximately 100 minutes of footage called and edited by Clark herself from a 12 hour shoot in her duplex apartment in the legendary Chelsea Hotel, which documented Jason Holliday holding forth on his peripatetic life as an entertainer, domestic worker, hustler, and denizen of the sexual and racial undercommons. An immediate sensation upon its release, Clark's film impressed the likes of Allen Ginsberg and Igmar Bergman. Gilles Deleuze included a discussion of it in his 1985 cinema two, treatise, Cinema Two: The Time Image. The port I always like this idea of, of Jason Holliday helping uh, shape uh, French post-structuralist theory from within. <laughs> Yet Portrait of Jason has also continued to draw detractors who've considered it for a voyeuristic exploitation, exploitation of a vulnerable subject. Critics have focused on the power the white female director, Shirley Clark, wielded over her black gay male subject, Jason Holliday. The film has been characterized as a racist enactment of film as an apparatus of capture of black life in which the exposure of the vulnerable peripatetic holiday, which the exposure the vulnerable peripatetic holiday gained was tantamount to his endangerment and exploitation by a privileged member of the New York City avant-garde. And there's something in crushed shadows that binds cinema to theater and both to painting and poetry, something that enables Shirley Clark's portrait of Jason to hold light within dark, black within white, and an incommensurable commons within both. In evoking the incommensurable in relationship to the projects of the restoration of a film on the one hand, and on the other, the practice of reparative reading, I am consciously evoking the work of Jose Munoz. 
responding to the antagonism and dissent Clark's film continues to produce, to produce, in particular between white feminist genealogies and black queer ones, I seek in this chapter a reading that works in the reparative mode Munoz moved in, one that acknowledges antagonism and negativity rather than denying it. Instead of gra gradual revelation, uh, perfect restoration, or the trope of what Heather Love has termed the emotional rescue of the historical queer by the well-meaning, well-adjusted critic in the present, these strategies offer us an alternative that I want to call invoking a long subterranean tradition of black escape and fugitivity, dark fabulation. This is my moment, Holiday tells Clark's camera at one point. I'm here on the throne, and I can say whatever I damn please, but it's got to be righteous, you know? Everything about this moment in the film turns on the inflection Holiday places on the word righteous, a key emphasis that qualifies his relaxation into sovereign self-possession behind his puff of smoke and a sip of whiskey, and brings into play a collective black idiom of spiritual struggle for post-secular freedoms. It is important to note how Holiday, through this emphasis on truth and right, pluralizes the moment of his cinematic visibility. He is a queen on the throne, able to finally say what he pleases, no matter how profane. But that saying must be righteous, that is to say, it must do a kind of justice that is incompossible with the conditions under which he appears, which is to say that the saying bespeaks a kind of justice that is incommensurate with the rights accorded under the law that held him, lest we forget, doubly, triply criminal, as he spoke. And that justice has everything to do with the possibility for black social life as manifested under conditions of generalized dishonor and stigma. Jason, the director, later noted to an interviewer, lives nowhere. Where does someone who lives nowhere come from? Where does that person go? Jason dares us to respond to this question wherever and whenever we are. Has this moment been righteous? Where are we to locate righteousness in a dissolute, fatiguing, 12-hour film shoot in a penthouse apartment in the Chelsea Hotel, with a subject being plied with liquor and reefer by a white director before being heckled by, here and later, her matinee uh, idol boyfriend. What kind of moment is this? Barbara Kruger levels what has become the standard indictment against the film when she criticizes its director's disturbing indulgence in cultural and racial tourism. Clark, who made several films about black life in New York City, in particular The Cool World from 1964, did see herself as a kind of reporter from the dangerous frontiers of urban life, a position that, however sympathetic to her subjects, nonetheless arrogates to her, the privileged filmmaker, the rights of representation. Her editing of the film has come under scrutiny as well. Charles Nero has placed the film in a series of narratives in which a black gay subject is ultimately exposed by the white directed camera as an imposter. Gavin Butt has produced, has produced perhaps the most balanced assessment of the film to date, arguing on the one hand that Clark's psychic and social cross identifications with black men comprise a queer feminism, while acknowledging on the other how problems of social class are, as much as anything else, played out in the film's intersubjective mise-en-scene. Such imperfect and troublesome relationships, but goes on to note, are the very stuff that make portrait that makes Portrait of Jason an important work of avant-garde film, a position I corroborate and amplify here. That is to say, if Portrait of Jason was from its inception troublingly imperfect, then the best that restoration or recovery could hope for might be to amplify those imperfections. The tangled relationships in the film would need to grapple with the feelings of shame, delight, exposure, and anger that Portrait both de de depicts and evokes, complications that strike at the heart of all we risk when we claim both life and art for performers, for performance. Many viewers of the film are most disturbed by the turn it takes towards the end, when, after demanding tale after tale from Holiday, Clark and her crew, including her partner Lee, abruptly turn on Holiday, calling him out for some despicable lies he has ostensibly told and reduce him to tears, which they piteously reject as yet another manifestation of his deceitfulness and deception. Astonishingly, Holiday concurs with this accusation, immediately drives up, and ends the film announcing the entire experience a happy and successful one. It is unsettling to viewers to find themselves aligned with a documenting camera that has by imperceptible degrees attached itself from its ostensible neutrality and become a hostile tool of interrogation motivated by jarring hostility. As the film thus turns from an ordinary spectacle to a discomforting situation, 
the mood alters in such a way as to leave many viewers from their different positionalities feeling awkwardly complicit. Portrait of Jason makes a provocative case study for investigating the question of loss and repair. And if the dominant impulse is to bring the truths about this film to light, I want to step into the block shadows instead in order to look elsewhere. I want to take the question of agency in the portrait and distribute it in and out of the places marked crushed black, the zones of indistinction between the theater and cinema, between poetry and the, and the graphic arts. As Portrait of Jason reveals, nightlife is indeed a space where queerness and blackness co-animate each other in ways rarely captured in daytime. Familiarity with classic associations of night with sleep, dream, intoxication, and sex might lead us to overlook in our knowingness the difference every nightlife must make to research and interpretive methods better calibrated to the world of other sobriety. Exchanging day for night entails more than extending around the clock a method developed for nine to five. As Shane Vogel argues, nightlife possesses its own epistemology of secrecy and exposure. To plunge into its orbit is to circle around a star whose light unsteadily flickers. It is the life in every nightlife, its dark vitality, that I want to both attend to and problematize in my genealogy of the black and queer performances that are archived in Portrait of Jason. Not only was the subject of Portrait of Jason a prominent figure of every nightlife and one whom Andy Warhol longed to capture, but the production of the film itself was an enactment of it. Begun at 9 p.m. on a Saturday night in Clark's duplex apartment, the shoot lasted until 9 a.m. the following morning. In, a, in pursuit of a subject who might reveal an unguarded facet of his truth to the camera, Clark's gaze alighted on, on Holiday as someone who, by her later re recollection, desired to be in front of a camera but did not, did not yet know how to hide himself from it. Holiday's overt theatricality, his readiness with quips, body stories, and sentimental ones, his movie star impersonations, and his little bits of business from a cabaret act he was forever in the process of getting together. All this composed a surfeit of appearance that Clark planned to crack open, precisely by giving Holiday what he claimed most to want, an audience. That her film shoot was motivated by hostility toward Holiday and formed part of a plan to revenge herself for a tremendous insult from him adds another layer of aggression to the cool, seemingly neutral pose of the recording apparatus. And this is not just an encounter between the filmmaker and her subject. Because the camera never pulls away from Holiday, viewers of the film only gradually become only gradually aware of the number of other people in the room. Director Clark's voice is heard early on, and Holiday interacts with two other male voices, most notably that of the actor Lee, Carl Lee, who is present on set but played no official role in, in the production. Interposed be between his throne and the audience of posterity is the circle of Clark, her erst erstwhile lover Lee, and her small crew in its and a small crew. It is in this mix of durations, this inter inanimation of the living arts of theater and film, what I want to call a living room theater emerged. It is in this theater, I wager, that the occluded and blocked up shadows of every nightlife took shape. It is also in relation to the terms of this theater and against them that Jason Holiday performed. In reading the ephemeral evidence of this kind of inter inanimation of the hetero and homosexual in downtown New York, I turn to the poet Marilyn Hacker, who offers one account of the game of concealment and revelation in every night life in a 1985 poem in which she recollects fragments of life in the Greenwich Village of the 60s with her then husband, Samuel Delaney. This is an excerpt from Hacker. Moon dark to dawn, loud streets were not quite scary footnotes in a nocturnal dictionary of argot softer on my ears than known four-walled cadenzas. A little later in the poem, she continues, five months short of 20, I knocked back whatever the river sent. He was gone two days, might bring back on the third, some kind of night music I'd never heard. Sonny, the, bu the burglar, paunched with breakfast beers, olive-skinned Simon, ma who made fake vermeers, the card sharp who worked club cars down the coast. Hacker's account of hospitality to her errant husband's various tricks is remarkable for its lack of moralism, anger, or self-pity. Rather, the poet's domestic scene setting quietly steals thunder from both her spouse's putative infidelities and the heteronormativity that they both reject by reading her poetics out of a, quote, nocturnal dictionary, unquote, that lies at the threshold 
between living room and street in the duration between moondark and dawn. Hacker's poems, later interpolated into the Blaney's own memoir, The Motion of Light and Water, offers a model for listening to and speaking from the night music of every nightlife, a poetics that gives space to the tensions and affordances of interracial homosexual cohabitation and compassion in a manner that falls short of reconciliation, but doesn't advance as far as total repudiation. In my mind, at least, this other black-white domestic couple making do in the 1960s offers an alternate angle on the tumultuous games played by Clark and Lee in a relationship riven by drug addiction and violence and dangerous enough to ensnare Holiday in the psychodrama of a living room theater recorded and exposed to posterity. I'll stop there, thanks. Um, really quickly, we met in um, we met in like 2015, mainly because I was going to do uh, an exhibition in Toronto, and I was writing I was writing a monologue for it that was going to be the main part of the exhibition, and um, and it was about something about like all my problems with just the weirdness of American acting and psychological realism, and you know, just how kind of insane it actually seemed, even though it was the mainstream thing. And on my Facebook feed showed um, showed this person Shawnee so Miller because I'm a, I'm a really promiscuous, <laughs> you know, friend friend <laughs> Facebook person. Um, and just just this thing said, "It's here, it's here," and it was the cover of this book called Method Acting and Its Discontents by this by this putative friend of mine <laughs> um, who I didn't know. And I was like, "Oh my God!" I was like, "And the subtitle was Psychodrama." And on American. American Psychodrama, so I contacted her and I was like, we have to, we, we, have, we have to hang out, and, and hang out, we did, and then we, and then we talked to Sean, who proved super influential on like this monologue I wound up writing, and then we wound up doing stuff in Toronto, and then uh, we decided to do a book together, um, on, uh, uh, which would, which would contain like a brand new essay of Ashani, um, and then a reprint of the, of the printing of the monologue that was performed in Toronto. Uh, sort of a brand new essay, although it was also like, I, I think it, it was supposed to be sort of outtakes from my book, everything that was like too crazy right. and personal <laughs> and like fucked up to include in the actual book. But then it took on a life of its own and became an original essay. Yeah. So, and, <laughs> and then, um, and so we made this artist book which had like prints that I made for the exhibition, which were all like, like occulted versions of like images from the actor's studio and Sean and I wound up spending a long afternoon one day making a very paranoid diagram of the secret history of the 20th century through method acting and the book and so that that wound up being the whole book which is coming out with the third state um, at the end of the month. It's called The Discourse on Method. Um, yeah. So yeah. So what we're gonna what we're gonna do since it's all about acting is we're gonna turn it over to these actors. Shani will introduce her thing, read by Blaine Redmer and all. I don't think I'm gonna introduce. Okay, that. great. <laughs> but except to say, um, thank you, Lane. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> Should I yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I bought a plane ticket to Madison, Wisconsin in a fit of panic during the summer of 2014. I had actually been in a semi-constant state of panic from the moment I signed my book contract the previous spring, certain that this apparent happy event would result in one way or another in some sort of ornate shattering downfall, which I imagined in every more, even ever more tawdry and megalomaniacal images. But this was different. I hadn't visited Wisconsin theater collection where the 406 cassette tapes recorded at the actor's studio between 15, 1956 and 1969 have been housed since Lee Strasberg's death in 1982. I had to go, I told Michael, in the neutral voice of inarguable domestic imperative. I booked a flight from New York to Chicago where I would change planes for Madison and arrive at a hotel near the university around 8 p.m. I would wake up the next morning and go promptly to the archives, where I would sit in meditative stillness and take rigorous notes for the duration of the workday. And I would discover extraordinary things that would raise my argument to new heights by thoroughly corroborating what I already knew. And I would commune with the voice of Lee Strasberg, which would ensconce me in the cooling mists of authorial, of authorial 
legitimacy. As we landed in Chicago, it began to storm. The plane to Madison was delayed, then delayed again. I waited in the terminal and sent Michael pictures of the sky from my phone. My flight was canceled, and there wasn't another available until the next afternoon, meaning I was going to lose more than a half of my time at the archives. I called the only person I knew in Chicago, asked if I could stay the night at his place, and got in a cab. I met Josh our first year as theater majors at the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. Two weeks after we started college, we watched the Twin Towers burn from our dorm windows. He made up a bed for me in his living room, pushed aside beer bottles and paperbacks. After, I went to, after he went to sleep, I opened one of the books on the coffee table called The Guys and Gals of Beverly Hills 90210, which described the life practices and moral value system of Jason Priestley, Shannon Doherty, and Luke Perry. The storm had ended by the next morning. Josh walked me to a car rental where they gave me directions to Madison. I was so worried about taking the wrong turn that I kept the radio silent the whole way. The Wisconsin Historical Society is housed in an imposing building on the east end of the University of Wisconsin campus with a long row of ionic columns embedded in the facade. I took an elevator up to the fourth floor for the Center of Film and Theater Research, where the archivist expected me. I requested five tapes, three tagged effective memory exercise. Not including the librarians, there were four other people in the room, which was brightly lit, with furniture that looked about 30 years old. The archivist reminded me that I could manually copy down whatever I liked, but that no recordings of any kind could be made of the materials. I assured him of my compliance. The voice of Lee Strasberg is anxious and strained. He repeats himself and digresses at length, and his verbal tics are ubiquitous. So to say, as indicated by, the result of which, it's a voice and a speech pattern of someone trying to communicate something important. But as I listened to the audio tapes, I felt to me that somehow the content had gone missing or had been transformed into familiar sounding but indecipherable dialect. There were long stretches that made close to no sense to me. Exegesis is a plays I'd never heard, long iterations of the same instructions to multiple actors that sounded both epithetic and strangely blank. The most interesting in what Strasbourg had to say about emotional experience, and so I listened hardest during those sections. This is because I had a hunch that for all his talk about truth and authenticity, and for all the language of humanism, his method actually pointed in a different direction, towards a cyborg emotionality, the machinic self, fired with the blowtorch of mysticism. <laughs> Going to acting school had been the best way I could think of to get the, to New York without completely alienating my school teacher parents. But once there, I imagined myself sui generis, sui generis. I remember telling someone, in all seriousness, that I wanted to be an art object. <laughs> I'm not sure what I thought this meant, but that at the time, but now I can see that I did what I did mean. It was a fantasy of enclosure. I wanted to be a thing. John Paul Sartre would call this bad faith. Jacques Lacan would call it the armor of alienating identity. Simone de Beauvoir would call it identifying with the patriarchy. <laughs> I think it was all of the above. <laughs> In my acting classes at Tisch, I was often reticent to participate. Anytime I had to get up in front of the class, though, I became focused. One of our first assignments was to write down a monologue for ourselves about our lives. I had a hangover that day, and I had to present it and I had just bleached my hair in the dorm bathroom. Perversely, the teacher had pulled back the curtain from the mirrored wall of the classroom so that we could watch ourselves acting. I can still picture my 18-year-old self with straw hair, pinching my eyes and crying. Strasbourg's exercises can be divided into two basic categories. The first is devotion to relaxation. The first is devoted to relaxation. Strasbourg is convinced that human beings are blocked that these blockages stem from social and cultural conditioning, and that unblocking the actor is the first step towards authentic emotional expression. The second group of exercises is devoted to its own form of conditioning, conditioning the actor to respond to fictional sensory and emotional material as he or she would, would to, real, to real sensory and emotional material. Here is where things get tricky. The actor practices what is called effective memory, which includes both sense memory and emotional memory exercises to train her to respond to stimuli on stage in a truthful and authentic way. She imagines she's holding a breakfast drink and practices smelling and tasting it. She also practices emotional recall, summoning up emotional memories from her past and reliving them. 
The internal sequence of the emotional memory exercise changed somewhat over the course of Strasberg's career, but it always started when the act, with the actor narrating the emotional event from her past sensorially, what she saw, what sound she heard, what texture she felt, and then reenacting the event without narrating it. After the actor had practiced this many times, she would be able to summon up the real emotion she felt in her past all at will while she was performing. The emotional memory exercise is the most famous and controversial of Strasberg's exercises, and the crux of the criticism that he was practicing unlicensed psychotherapy. <laughs> At the Historical Society, I listened to tape recordings of several effective memory exercises, taking notes on my laptop. This is from a tape marked Anastanovich, 1966, April 19th. Long pause on the tape. From, 22, or from minute 20, 28, uh, 12 seconds to minute 29 and 15 seconds. We just hear her breathing. Then she screams, ah! almost as if disgusted or frustrated. And then she sobs several times. And then silence. Sobs again at minute 30 and six seconds. Continues sobbing, maybe laughing, sobbing louder. Uh, she says something, all right. I wish from that, and then it's inaudible. And then another two minutes of silence, moving around the room, sighs. Another five minutes of silence. Then Strasberg says, that's it. Now, had you intended to do more? Why didn't you? Anna says something inaudible. You've gotten very frightened of what? Pause, Anna. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I just got very frightened at one point. I left the archives that night before it closed. I was tired of listening to Strasberg berate actors and monologue about nothing. His voice had started blurring in my head with the voice of my grandfather, a psychiatrist <laughs> controlling a narcissistic person. When I started doing the research for my dissertation on method acting in my third year of graduate school, it seemed like a perfect way to use an otherwise wasted chapter of my life. <laughs> but during the six years or so of working on it, I often felt like one, of, like one of the studio actors on the tape recordings, uncertain, resentful, desperate for approval, and terrified by the specter of annihilation lurking around every turn. I tried to go to bed early, but tossed and turned for hours. I wondered if I had food poisoning. I half hallucinated that I was stuck in Madison forever, trudging endlessly into the archives, imprisoned with the voices of the vengeful mid-century, slowly turning into something, maybe a pillar of salt. I spent the rest of the night violently throwing up in the bathroom. Getting sick by yourself in a hotel room is an unfamiliar, in an unfamiliar city is an existentially rich experience. <laughs> Deprived of the opportunity to, th to theatricalize my feebleness for an audience, I could focus on nothing but the gross substances of my usually coddled body. In a feverish self-aggrandizement, I started to feel exalted, as if vomiting the contents of my stomach somehow got me closer to the pit of my bare life. The entire trip had been somewhat masochistic from the beginning. This felt like a literalization of an abjection that, in other forms, I secretly loved the most about acting. It was obvious that Lee Strasberg was cursing me from beyond the grave. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just, uh, just a little bit of context. So the monologue, the monologue is called Edition of Eight, and it was memorized by eight different actors, um, so that whenever you walked into this gallery for five or six weeks, there was always somebody doing it, um, hence, hence the title. Um, it is actually done from the point, it, it is actually, the subjectivity is actually a monologue. Just keeps inhabiting different bodies, um, and it does not actually ever shut up. Uh, and at some point, it pitches a movie, which is what uh, which is what you're going to hear. I'm going to get this out of the way. I always wanted to write this screenplay. This penguin-looking guy, short, white, ethnic. Basically Richard Dreyfuss, or Al Pacino, or Dustin Hoffman, or any of those guys who became stars in the early 70s, moves to New York to become an actor. He falls under the influence of Lee Strasberg, the inventor of method acting at the actor's studio. Riots going on, bombings, Vietnam, all that stuff. Our guy is passively involved. I mean, he walks by the demonstrations, he watches the news, 
but he's mainly studying his craft and working as a short order cook in Times Square and does some downtown semi-experimental theater. And one time, he's helping out on a Jack Smith kind of experimental short that's shooting at the factory. And the movie's about Paula, specifically about the afternoon in autumn, 1951, when Hans Namath, the photographer and filmmaker, filmed Pollock painting. Because supposedly, that evening, Pollock fell off the wagon after two years sober. That was the night he flipped a dining table over on Clement Greenberg. Because supposedly, painting on camera, doing retakes, performing, being a painter for Hans, made Pollock feel like such a phony, such a fake, such an actor, that he never recovered. <laughs> Pollock never felt like a genuine artist again. Americans. So hung up on authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. Pollock in a white t-shirt painting, Brando in a white t-shirt screaming, Chris Burden in a white t-shirt getting <laughs> shot. So primal. Anyway, during the shoot, something goes wrong. It's at the factory, so it's that kind of shoot, so everyone's on drugs, and the guy playing Pollock, I think it's Robert Quine, <laughs> has a meltdown. He's on a lot of LSD, and during the scene where they recreate Pollock painting on glass so that Neiman could film Pollock painting underneath, midway through, the actor starts hyperventilating, and suddenly he puts his fist through the glass. He's so in character at that moment, he's so immersed in Pollock's anguish at performing himself that he plunges his fist through the glass again and again, getting huge shards of glass in his wrist, weeping, weeping punching through glass again and again, crying, this is how it ends, this is what happens, this is the new sublime. And it's the most compelling performance our Serpico-looking hero, who's just helping out in this film, has ever seen. But also, the most aversive. You're standing back watching, but only because you don't dare get close. You're only an audience because you don't dare get close. This is all the trauma, all the naked humanness emanating in terrifying waves that Lee Strasberg is constantly trying to get out of him at the studio, and yet these waves are also fundamentally repellent. They make you into an audience. But it's like Rosemary says, this is no dream. This is really happening. And it really makes you wonder why people make such a big deal about catharsis. Because this is actually what that feeling is like. And Sure, the ancient Greeks were into it, but maybe celebrating that feeling only makes sense in a society that restricts the vote to upper-class males and encourages owning slaves. But the drugs. This guy's bleeding on the floor, still crying. They're all fucked up. How are they going to get this guy to the hospital? But they manage. And somehow Warhol's money takes care of the rest. But it's a long night of the soul for our guy. He doesn't know if he's ever going to be able to come up with a performance like that. He rides the subways, the seas, the sea, the N, the seven, out into Queens, back into Manhattan, until he sobers up and we see him alone, wandering down Cornelia Street in a black leather jacket in the 5 a.m. light. The World Trade Center is going up behind him. And back to his fourth floor walk, he stands in the living room, backward, and makes a fateful decision. His roommate, or playwright, is asleep. It's time. It's time to go. It's time to go to Hollywood and seek his fortune in film and TV. And because early 70s, he decides to drive. <laughs> Aerial view of the West Side Highway now, that kind of acoustic guitar that with wordless singing that always accompanies hitting the road montage in the early 70s. We see him in the rolling countryside of Pennsylvania, powering down interstates in Ohio, clocking endless hours straight through wheat fields on Kansas local roads. Everywhere he goes, he encounters a lens flare. Everywhere he goes, he meets salt of the earth types who are willing to share their table and break bread with him and are changed, no, blessed by his company in turn. Everywhere he goes, he meets women. Daughters, mothers, either free spirits or yearning to be, who give him the gift of their bodies for a night and ask nothing in return. He beds down with communes in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, 
Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, takes peyote, LSD, gets high, learns about sustenance farming and guitar, finds America as Simon and Garfunkel instruct us to. It's basically an hour-long montage. And by the time he arrives in L.A., his Malibu, 40 to 101 at dusk, the Capitol Records building rising up against the sunset like Skull Mountain calling out to King Kong, it, ten years have passed, and it's 1981. <laughs> Don't ask me how, it's like a time warp. He doesn't even notice. So, we're in Act 3 now, and our guy, should I give him a name? Uh, locks into an audition and gets a job almost instantly as the sidekick on a new TV show about a crime-fighting stunt. He moves into a new home in the hills. He's a fresh new face and up-and-coming young star. He's been seen dating Lindsay Wagner, the bionic woman. <laughs> He's still taking classes, still trying to improve his craft at the actor studio West. And in his spare time, hangs out with Lee Strasberg's daughter, Susan, and her abusive husband, Chris, and Lee's drug out son, John. He's having a high old time, but he's a cipher. No one feels like they know him. His publicist frequently invites journalists to stress the fact that he does all his own stunts, like the young Steve McQueen. And in interviews, he mutters sexy and cryptic things like, I just want to feel, just want it to feel real, you know? <laughs> He's still going to classes, still working on finding his truth, and midway through shooting for season two, something terrible. Our guy is doing his own stunt, jumping from the roof of a four-story building onto the winch of a moving crane in order to intercept a fleeing jewel thief on the street below. When the crane swings wide, momentum carries him smack into the brick face of the building opposite, and he lets go of the cable and falls three stories onto an awning and bounces off, landing on the street face down. He's not moving. Everyone is frozen. Give him room! Let him breathe! The emergency vehicle for the Paramount lot has been called, but slowly, he starts to give up on his own. His stuntman skills have saved him. Taught him how to break his fall. He's on all fours now, still bent over, and slowly rises to one knee and looks up. Everyone steps back. What's happened? Is he bloody? Is his nose broken? Are his teeth missing? He raises a hand to his face, still looking at the assembled crowd, and realizes there's no face there. There's a face-sized depression. Crisscrossed with wires, transistors, chips. His plastic eyeballs dart left, then right. And he turns his head and sees his face about 20 feet away, lying face up on the dusty soundstage street. He rises slowly to his feet, picks up his face, and walks away. He had no idea. <laughs> this is, of course, the end of everything. Career, friendships, all of it. In a coda, we see him. Months later, walking down the beach in Malibu or San Clemente, in plaid shorts and a hoodie, face plate off, <laughs> scanning the lonely beach with a metal detector. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you all. Thank you. That was great. Um, at the very end, I want to ask about where your projects are and just to say more and where people can find you. But 
first I have two questions for the group. One is about writing and the other is about reading. So the first one, um, you know, the, the Ilfe title of this event was from an F. Scott Fitzgerald quote, you know, writing feels like swimming underwater and holding your breath. So I'm interested um, if anyone wants to talk about what the experience of writing is for them and what tactics do you employ to try to get words onto the page. I'll say for myself, I'm a huge advocate of Neil Gaiman's um, advice, which is that you should either, you should give yourself two options. You can either write or you can do nothing. And that's what you can do. And then eventually you will become so bored that you, you will just feel compelled to start writing because what else can you do other than sit and bored? So that's what I've been using uh, in my own writing practice, such as it is. So I'm curious if other people have developed um, strategies, tactics, or feelings, or you can talk about your own objection. Uh, yeah, uh, self-loathing. No, uh, I, I, I find that each project, the writing process is really different. Maybe that's because I choose sort of very different projects, I don't know, but I just find that like what writing actually is changes from, from thing to thing. For this book in particular, it's like a very involved, iterative process of reading things and then putting them in a color-coded Google Doc so that I can go back and cite them easily, and then that eventually becomes an outline, and then I take that outline and a pad of paper and I write it out longhand with nothing with access to the internet anywhere near me, uh, and then I then type that up into, you know, so like it's just like you're just constantly going over it again and again and again. Um, uh, but that's nothing like what my writing process has been on, on, on anything else I've done. It's just that what I had to do to like get going on this one personally. Other thoughts? Things you want to share? Yeah, I think that, um, some, yeah. Um, I, I, um, I haven't yet tried the color coded Google Docs, but uh, like mental note, I'm always looking for some, uh, some some hack that I don't yet know about in terms of like how to um, collect and collate and organize. Um, I'm a big fan of of doing research. I guess before you know researching and researching, I have to be as far away from the internet as possible to the to the point where I'll, I'll even go to do, doing initial drafts um, by hand if necessary, uh, just to just to kind of filter out the noise. Um, and that's something that sort of happened over the you know 20 years of my adult life as a writer. It's just the, the, the you know uh, the you know the latest thing now is some of you know that you can actually write from from uh, you can dictate your writing now you know, increasingly you know so it's almost like you can just like skip the process of writing altogether and just go straight to the audio. Um, but um, and I also I write um, I both write. W collaboratively, like I write in collective, like, like I, I, I like collaborative writing, and I like writing with other people, meaning like separately, but we meet, meet we get together to have like a writing date. I somehow find that's like might, might be my version of writing or nothing, right? <laughs> it's that like it's you can't socialize, you have to write while, and then and if you do a certain amount of time writing, then you can, can you know, get a coffee and talk. I don't, I'm not sure where to go with this question. I, I guess, um, well, because I trained as an actor, um, I'm like really turned on by self-revelation, but also really turned off by it. Um, so uh, I think that this particular piece uh, was about negotiating that. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I guess uh, with this piece, um, I was really excited and inspired by David's um, David's piece, which I had seen in Toronto, and so I was thinking about ways that I wanted to respond to it um, from my own perspective. Uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I think I, I, I guess I guess, um, but I guess I guess there is something about uh, performing a character in writing that I find generative and exciting. And I think that David's mode of the monologue was one uh, enabling way in for me. But it's one fun fact, Johnny, is like that that archive, the University of Washington, Wisconsin Madison. Yeah, yeah. That's where the, that's where the Shirley Clark papers are. 
I, I did research there for, yeah, as well, yeah, yeah, for that chapter. Amazing. Yeah, we have we have illicit photos of that of that archive room in the book as well. Um, I I uh, I really hate writing and I really enjoy revising. So I think over a long time of actually writing a, like publishing a fair amount of stuff, I think I evolved this system where I lock myself up. Um, I lock myself up in a crowded cafe and just just vomit out as much stuff as I can in you know in like an hour or so and I don't even look back at what I'm writing and then the next and then I go back to then the next day I do the same thing and then the third day I do the same thing and then on the fourth day I go back to what I wrote but cannot remember on the first day and see if there's anything salvageable in it and from there on I start dividing my time between like vomiting up new stuff and then doubling back to stuff I don't remember writing as though it was written by somebody else and then I'm capable of judging it or revising it and then slowly some kind of format takes shape which has been working for me for the past couple of years but you know who knows I would only add one other thing, which was like in researching this book, uh, which I'm only a third of the way through having written a draft, which you heard some of today. Um, you know, I, I eventually found this is this is going to sound crazy, but why not? We're on a panel. Um, uh, I eventually found that I could sort of take take tips from how Stanislavski started approaching roles to how he approached yeah. to approaching writing. So, like. The, the, one of the major things that, again, we take for granted now is the um, dividing of the r job of the actor into discrete tasks. And you put those discrete tasks together and then you have developing the character. Or you take the bits, what they call bits, and then when the Russians came over here and taught it, they pronounced it beats and it became beats, uh, the, the beats of a story, right? And so he, he had this idea that an actor can't think about the whole role at once. They can think about the actions the character undergoes and then eventually put that all together and you have a role. And so every time, you know, I wake up often with like my heart racing like five beats at least faster than it should with like, how the fuck am I gonna manage everything that I have to manage to get through this? There's all these people who know more about it than me, you know, all the usual self-loathing stuff. And it's like, oh right, uh, I will break it into discrete tasks, into its bits, and then I will go bit by bit until I have enough together that I can make something. And so, you know, like, like uh, uh, that has been, that has helped get me over my um, hatred of, you know, the blank page and, and everything like that. It's like, I'm not going to write everything about the method today or read everything about the method today, but I can read, you know, Shawnee's amazing book and I can, you know, and I can write like some notes, you know, or, or whatever, or interview someone or whatever. And you just kind of bit by bit, so to speak, you know, get, get through it. I, I, I know that's sort of very boring, but it was very weird that like, at some point I was like, oh wait, I'm doing, I'm having the same approach to this that I'm reading him have about to his own thing. Although hopefully my book will be on time, unlike any of his productions and performances once he realized this. Um, in the spirit of revision, I'm gonna scrap my original second question. I have a different one, um, which is, uh, I think everyone, everyone in this panel has, um, you know, different practices, uh, uh, write, write criticism, write monologues, dramatic work, um, but also maybe poetry and um, teaching is also another practice. Um, and so I'm curious how the various acts, aspects of your work um, inform one another. Um, you know, what do you take from, we heard a little, we kind of gestured at with Shawnee's monologue and your storied acting education. Um, but I'm curious how you think about those two things, or three things, or however many intersections you work at. I like I started writing these monologues just because I, I you know, I sort of shifted from being a theater director to to exhibiting stuff in an art context, and I and I really missed, I really missed working with actors, and I really missed, you know, um, I mean, I missed all of that. So I just sort of started evolving like a way a way of sneaking one into the other, and the only way to really do that because well, initially I would just hire people to write, like I hire playwrights to write things for, for exhibition. But then that seemed like a cop out. So then I just started writing my own stuff, and I generally try to. I mean, my, I think the voice in it is generally the same voice as in my criticism, which is the same voices in, um, as as my voice in the classroom, which is you know, fairly enthusiastic, extremely bewildered, um, and, you know, kind of like, you know, like very assertive without having anything to back it up. Um, and I think that, I think, I think that voice is pretty much consistent through, 
through all the different fields that I am in. Yeah, I guess, I mean, um, so when I, when I said that this essay is like outtakes from my book, um, part of what that meant and means to me is that it's, it was everything that was actually like um, the most exciting, but that I had no evidence for and didn't sort of fit into um, a kind of, uh, you know, standard um, accepted scholarly practice. So lots of like, uh, you know, of course, like the personal stuff, but also, you know, this kind of just like sense that I had that there was this creepy thing going on with, um, with the method that nobody was really acknowledging, although it was completely central to the experience that so many uh, acting students and actors, I think, have. Um, so I guess that, you know, that, that I, I, do, I do think of this writing as a different mode than my scholarship. Like, and I, I, you know, sometimes I have fantasies about bringing them together more, but I also am kind of into not. Because I do think that there's an important place for um, evidence-based reasoning in the world, and I also think that there's an important place for, like, you know, flights of fantasy, um, and that 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 there that there is thirdly like a, a like moments when that can cross over, um, but it, you have to be really careful, I think, uh, in how you do that, and it has to be, um, I think, uh, it it has to be done in a way that that doesn't feel like flaky and unsatisfying, but rather feels like, uh, you know, exciting and suggestive. So I guess, yeah. I feel like that, that third space that you just described is like so much where I live, right? Between, oh, what do you say, evidence-based reasoning on the one hand and flights of fantasy. Um, and, and then it's, so for, for me it's, it's um, and in Afrofabulations, which is largely devoted to kind of iterative experiments and telling these kinds of stories that I don't want to tell the whole story in the traditional fashion. I don't want to do the traditional historical. Um, but I also, you know, I don't want to like get called out for, like, you know, making shit up, <laughs> making shit up, you know, or, you know, or, you know, like it's, 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 so there's a way it's almost like both and you kind of like make it even harder for yourself. You have to like do double duty, right? Um, and uh, so the version that I gave today was, something I never, I've never tried to do, which was just to take the story of the chapter out and tell only the story, and, and then you, what you missed was all the evidence. <laughs> I spared you as an audience here, right? And that's in the, in the paragraphs in between, right? So hopefully, you know, uh, I don't know if that worked or not, but it was an experiment, um, and it's one that I think a lot of, um, a lot of academics right now, I think as we're looking at like the state of the humanities to make a big large, you know, you know raise a, a large issue, right? We're called to communicate in ways that, um, I actually think that theater folks are well primed, you know, actually in some ways because of maybe these long histories of the method and other just theatricality writ large, we're actually well primed to sort of like answer that question of what it means to sort of like hit your mark, stand and deliver, <laughs> like communicate, even if it takes you 10 months or 12 years, however long it took him to make that show, um, there is that sense of like interface with the public that I think other parts of the humanities can really gain from, actually. We were having a conversation about this uh, this past summer, right? Or two summers ago, right? Uh, what, can, what, can, what, can, what can theater and performance contribute? Um, I think that's kind of answering the question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, you know, I was trained as an actor, um, it, sort of probably more Adler, I guess, but, uh, and then was a theater director and stuff like that. But, but you know, it's like, I, I always go back to, or, you know, like, this book has a particular set of challenges because it is a narrative work. It is a biography, but it's not a biography of a person, right? It's a biography of this idea and how it transformed and then it transformed others and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and so I just try to keep going back to that as a first principle. The, the easy part of it, and that's not easy, the, the clear part of it or the thing that I keep going back to that I think the theater background helps with is just looking at, like, what is the action of this story? What causes what to happen? There's this book that I don't actually like very much, but it's, it's useful for freshmen called Backwards and Forwards that, that is a, a book about script analysis, which is all about just putting a whole script together as a chain of causation, right? A causes B to happen, and you can go through a whole play from its ending to its beginning or its beginning to its ending if you've done it right. 
Um, that is a very useful idea when you're trying to tell any kind of story. And it, I feel like um, when you have the narrative and the narrative is clear and the narrative is exciting while still being rigorous, that's the difficult part, uh, in terms of you know, being factually accurate and things like that, you can fold all sorts of other stuff, you know, uh, can I start mixing my metaphors? You can fold all sorts of egg whites into that batter. Um, no, you can fold all sorts of other stuff into it. And so, um, you know, that's a lot of what we were doing uh, in the first book that I wrote, The World Only Spins Forward, the, the oral history of angels in America. A lot of it is about try, trying to figure out a way to do that. And I'm trying to figure out a way to do that, that here. Because, like, it, in order to understand the story of the method, there actually is a lot of bizarre conceptual stuff that you have to understand that I just want to make it very clear. No pioneer of any stage of the method was good at writing about it. Stanislavski is one of the most abominable writers you will ever read. Strasberg's dream of passion doesn't really explain anything. Adler's, uh, her only complete book on writing is just this sort of step of things with terms never explained. Um, uh, Boleslavsky is probably the best, but then his book is like, has anyone read Acting the First Six Lessons? Does anyone know, you guys know that? You know, it's this book where he's, he's imagining this dialogue with this impressionable young woman who is referred to in the book as the creature. And it's this series, it's six scenes where he's like, so even though, like, if you look up Boleslavsky's lectures, which have only really been published once in this Routledge edition, he's actually the clearest writer about what effect, affective memory is and all sorts of stuff. His own writing on it is garbage. So it's like, it's very, it's like that's its own, you know, there's a lot of challenging ideas you have to try to explain. You have to try to get them right, even though Stanislavski changed his mind about what all these words meant and stuff. And then, but you have to kind of like sneak it in amidst this story. The story is what's gonna keep people, you know, for my purposes, reading from page to page, um, I feel like. I, I just, just a quick, I mean, on the flip side of this, I, I, was, a, I was super influenced by this um, German playwright named René Polesch, uh, which mainly because he showed people like in the throes, in the throes of, like, in, in the throes of critical theory, like, massively overwhelmed by everything theory was doing to their head, and, like, and sort of related that to, like, an inability to get a grip on the contemporary situation, whatever it is. So that, so what it wound up doing was, it was, you know, he was, he was creating, like, a bunch of, like, everyday, you know, everyday critics who were incapable of getting on top of things, and they were, like, talking and talking and talking, trying to, and, like, that, that feeling seemed so, not seemed to, it was at once scholarly and completely non-objective and like full of affect and heat and I thought that was a really interesting way of of of, of going about it I mean sort of where where it's so blatantly illegitimate but so earnest in its attempt to like get a grip on what's going on that that would be another way of writing to communicate that yeah I, I do just to like circle back to this I do feel like there's you know I mean even as I um, kind of absurdly reductively like laid out a distinction between you know the Apollonian and the Dionysian of writing you know I, uh, I like I actually don't think that it's ever one or the other and that we're all like trying to muddle through a space of trying to find a, like something new to say that like makes something new possible in the world while also like being uh, 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 exciting in like an affective way. So I guess, I, I mean, I get, the truth is I do feel like the third place is where we all are, whether or not we admit it, like in that, yeah. Um, we have time for like one or two questions from the audience. Anyone have a question? I will uh, bequeath this microphone to you so you can be amplified and recorded. But any questions? I'll even allow a comment. Yes. No, no comment. <laughs> I have a question for everyone. Uh, I am wondering if you have a innate intuition for when when is enough uh, research enough? When when do you get to the point where okay, I think I know enough. I'm going to write about this. When you start to forget the stuff you had in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I, ooh, mm, uh, th this is at least for me. You know, there's every facet, every major kind of story chunk or character in in the story of the method someone has devoted their entire life to researching already you know what i mean like i will never know as much about the life of um well i probably know about as much about the life of john garfield as there is to know but i will never know you know enough about the life of i mean the, the guy who wrote the biography of richard boleslavsky 
which is actually quite a quite good biography. It's like 300 pages long. You know, he spent like 20 years writing it. You know, I, I went to his papers at the University of Scranton. It's very moving because he spent his whole life writing this, two, you know, his whole academic career writing this 295-page eh, book about a, a director who he really... What? Yeah. Well, well, I care about it. Uh, but, yeah, but no, you know, and I, I find that very... There's something very moving in a canticle for Leibowitz kind of way uh, uh, about that. But like... So the answer is you'll never know enough. You just at some point, like, I don't know, I feel like it's kind of intuitive at some point. You're just like, I'm so scared. I'm now starting writing. I don't know. I, I, just, I just think it's a mistake to think of one before the other. I mean, I think, you know, I think it, you, you, it's really like, you know, you research even as you write from ignorance and what you're spitting out will guide your research further. And I mean, they, I, I always feel like, it's they should they should they should be happening side by side. You should be getting smarter even as you're like you're like expressing your uninformed thoughts and opinions because those are actually the spine of what you know of, of what your argument's going to be even if they're ignorant. And then the reading the reading educates the writing and then the writing binds and focuses the reading and ideally they would have I mean to me they would happen at the same time. Can I have you as my, my editor now? I feel like that's like the best answer too because of what it, what it makes me think of, of course, is that even when you know something, you're still trying to communicate it to, to a reader who doesn't, right? So you actually have to preserve your ignorance enough so that you can convey it in the structure of the piece that you end up writing, right? I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, much more than what I was gonna say, which was just to add that um, for me, I think academia has all kinds of deadlines that just force me to turn up, to, to turn in, turn in, you know, um, uh, and, uh, and 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 those deadlines are just. Um, I mean, it's, it starts with having to turn in your term paper on time, and now it's like, do you want to write a book chapter for this anthology, you know, and taking those deadlines as just a kind of artificial way of getting me to get. Um, started right, and you know it's sad to say, but somehow sheer panic, along with, <laughs> you know, can get me can get me writing and can get me out of the state of um, of perpetual research, right? Um, I think we've all sort of faced that. Um, you know, you go back to your research notes and you, you years back in your research notes, and if you go back far enough, you realize you've had the same thought multiple times, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> so you just really need to. Like you do need those outside voices to remi reminding you that you know that that chapter is due. Other questions from the house. <laughs> I actually feel like uh, Shirley Clark right now, and you are, um, you know, Jason. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you again. It was really incredible listening to all of the work. Um, I guess my question is sort of surrounding the idea of fact. Um, and maybe evidence is the better word, uh, or how, I mean, especially in this day and age, uh, but especially in a Western context, because I think it's maybe different in, um, in the not West. Um, what exactly do you think your, um, your responsibility is to, or uh, to like, or like not responsibility, it's like, do you think there's like a true thing and then and then there's like a, or is it like do you have a point of view on a certain way that it a fact or like a life of like true things exists and you're using evidence to like back that up or is there like I'm just thinking about like when you guys are saying like you have to you have, like what is personal and therefore you know versus like what is ev you know like what you what you can take to your publisher? Like what are they gonna get mad at you about? When they, you know? Depending on the publisher, they won't get mad at you because publishers don't pay for fact checking. It's right. it's what you'll get caught if you're you know like that that thing with Naomi Wolf on the BBC where she got caught in that thing and you know it, it's what you'll get caught with afterwards. But yeah, no, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, well, I don't. I mean, I, I'm writing a. I don't know. It's like my my work is a work of nonfiction, and I I take getting the factual record accurate very seriously. Uh, it's not always possible. There's a bunch of um, sort of gray areas. I mean, um, we don't know. There's no, um, no one knows where the notes from Stella Adler's one-on-one um, uh, -on -one studies with Stanislavski are, or if they even ever existed. She came back from that and was like, 
You got it all wrong. This is how you do it. He backed me up. I'm right about everything. But those notes don't exist. I mean, they don't exist. There's a chart of what the system is. Um, we don't really know what the last decade of Stanislavski's life was really like and whether or not he was living under house arrest is a really big open question. Um, we don't know whether he protected Meyerhold. We do know that shortly after he died, Meyerhold was arrested and then he was essentially you know beaten to death and in prison so you know there there are you know you run up against things that you don't know the truth about and you try to get as close as possible i think you try to be as honest about that as possible but when there is an actual verifiable fact you have a duty to that fact to represent it i feel like i think Sanaz, that that question is actually what is so fascinating about method acting. I mean, that is actually like right. the question, <laughs> you know, so it's not, I don't think that's an answerable question. <laughs> I think that's that, that what's so interesting um, about this whole, if you want to call it a tradition or this whole um, line of, of, of in Korean experience that like goes by the name of method acting, it's that there's, there's at the same time that a truth and authenticity are postulated because they have to be structurally for the thing to work. Like everything else is undoing it. Um, and so, you know, I would argue that there's, that like the, the fiction of a truth or authenticity is, is only of the thinnest and actually it's, um, it's propping up all this other stuff. Um, and that that actually is like that other stuff is what's really interesting there. And even when we, when, when the exhibition was up, Shani came up and she led an affective memory exercise <laughs> with, with one of the actors. But even that, you know, like, and he really, he went, he went deep, you know, I mean, he was really like, and then afterwards I was like, I was like, was that real? And he was like, I mean, halfway, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, he was doing it for like the, the, one of the weird things about the affective memory exercises, they don't, they take place for an audience. Right. The audience is the rest of the studio. But there's no, so, and that is exactly that weird, flimsy half state of authenticity where it's sort of there and sort of performed and doesn't happen without an audience, so. Right, and, and like meanwhile, like we're all having like these, like these like very sincere conversations about do we just exploit this poor actor? Like he just like spilled his gut, you know what I mean? Like so like as, even as we're sort of, you know, we're rehearsing this, um, this, uh, all, the, all the problems of like truth and exposure, you know, he's like, well, you guys, you know, <laughs> sort of performed this for you. Um, awesome, I, I, I wanna wrap up a couple of thank yous. Um, thank you to Jack Smith, who's now been invoked twice during this festival. I feel like he's like <laughs> watching and braiding over us. Um, and thank you to, to Frank, the director of the Seagull Center. Thank you to Sanaz, who's also the co-curator, uh, in addition to audience participant of this festival, for envisioning this event along with me. And thank you to Tavia, Isaac, David, and Shani. And Lane, and Lane, and yes, Redmer, and Eric Cotty, who were there. Thank you to you guys. We don't get to keep the mic. Oh, and is this mic still on? Everyone should buy Afro Fabulations at a bookstore other than Amazon and a discourse on method when it comes out. Oh, yeah. At the, yeah. You can pre order at the 53rd State website. Yes. Yes. So yeah, I love that. Yeah. Right.